Oh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our uh, webinar where we are going to present our uh, new uh, autumn forecast for 23 countries of Central East and Southeast Europe. Um, I'm deliberately starting slowly because I can see that people are coming in. So welcome to everybody who is joining. It's nice to see so many uh, of you here. Um, my name is Richard Griefson. I'm deputy director here, and I will be uh, moderating uh, this uh, this webinar. I'm very happy to say that uh, I have with me Branimi Jovanovic, who was the main author of of our uh, report this time, and, and and he will do the main presentation. And we also have Maryam Gukten, who is our Turkey expert and expert in many other things as well. And she will also be here for, for questions, especially related to Turkey, which we are anticipating uh, we're anticipating some. So um, I'll pass over to Branimir in a, in a moment just to sort of set the scene. So um, as often, we're presenting this forecast in quite volatile times, a um, lot of challenges at the moment, some um, some difficult um, things that the region is facing, not least the the, the war in Ukraine, which is which is of course uh, ongoing. More recently, events in Nagorno Karabakh, in in Kosovo, and now of course in Israel, all of which also have have economic uh, implications for for our region, and we probably will discuss uh, that uh, in the question and answer session as well. Branami will talk for I think twenty twenty five minutes, so the main picture the main stories the main the main forecast and then we go to the to the questions and answer but you can type them at any point so you'll see the the q and a or if you're here with us in the german speaking world f and a uh, box underneath please any point type your questions as we go along we'll collect them and 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 answer them at the end so um i'll stop here for now and i pass over to to Branimir for the presentation Thanks, Richard for, uh, Richard, for the kind introduction, and thanks everybody else for coming to this presentation today. It's a pleasure for me uh, to present our report, uh, our latest report, which we prepared together uh, with the colleagues from the Institute. And uh, while I'm sharing my screen, well, let's hope everything goes okay. Uh, let me say that uh, the, we titled this report uh, Beneath the Winner of Calm, trying to send the message that if you look at the main macroeconomic indicators of the of Eastern Europe, like GDP growth and inflation, it seems that the region is doing relatively well. But still, if you dig a bit underneath this uh, surface, uh, you will notice that things are not so good. And that's the main message that we want to convey uh, this time. So the report is structured in five points. The first one refers to the GDP growth. And the main message here is that the growth is solid overall, but there are many question marks. And then the second topic is, of course, inflation. The main message there is that it's still high and it's uh, starting to cause social unease. Then uh, the third uh, point, uh, third topic is uh, the monetary fiscal policy mix. And the main message there is that it's not that supportive. And then about the energy situation, of course, the main story there is that it's better than last year, but still there are some risks. And the last point, the last topic that we will talk about is the outlook for the next two and a half years for the whole region uh, overall. And the main uh, story there is that uh, it seems that we are con converging or trending towards a new equilibrium, which uh, will be characterized by lower growth and higher inflation from the period, let's say, before the pandemic. So let's start with the first topic, which is uh, about GDP growth. Uh, so if you look at the overall GDP growth for the region in the second quarter, the unweighted average, the, the simple average for the whole region, was that uh, the, uh, the GDP growth was around 1.5. And that's uh, certainly better than the EU average, which was around zero. So while the EU European Union stagnated in the second quarter, Eastern Europe had some growth. And you would say that this is uh, kind of okay. Also, when you look at the countries, you can see that around two thirds of the countries had positive uh, GDP growth. So uh, two thirds of the countries grew, while just uh, a few countries, like five, five countries, had a decline. So it seems to be like a nice a nice overall story maybe. But what's interesting to note here is that is, uh, what's important to note here is that there are um, uh, uh, very big differences across different sub-regions and countries. 
in the whole region. So for example, uh, on the one hand side, you have Montenegro, which grew around 7% in the second quarter. And then on the other hand, you had Estonia, we had Estonia which uh, declined by around 3% which is uh, certainly worse than the whole EU. And if we can notice some patterns here, I will go into greater details later on about this. But if we, if we try to identify some patterns here, it would seem that the Western Balkan countries grew a little bit more than the others. And we explain this by the strong FDI that they had, but also by the strong remittances. Also, of course, by the lower general level of development that these countries have. And you know, the law of economic convergence states that the less developed the country is, the faster it will grow. So Western countries seem to perform slightly better than the others. Then we have uh, the, the next pattern is that the countries which have a big tourism sector, like Montenegro, Croatia, Albania, they also perform slightly better than the others. But then on the other hand, we have the countries from Central Europe, the Visegrad countries in particular, which uh, grew, uh, which uh, basically had a decline. Three of these four countries had declined, and that owes to the German recession. Obviously, the recession in Germany is taking toll on these economies. And we also noticed that the Baltic countries uh, didn't perform quite well uh, either. And that uh, we, we explained that in, in principle by uh, the exposure of these countries, by the sensitivity of these countries to the developments in Russia in general. I'll go into greater details of these uh, things uh, later, uh, as, as, as I present further. So uh, uh, it's interesting also to compare the growth uh, in the second quarter with the growth from the previous two quarters. And we can see that the, for the whole region, uh, the gr uh, growth from Q2 of uh, 1.5 was uh, slightly better than the growth in, in Q1, which was uh, around 0 0.5, and also better than the growth from the, the last quarter of last year. Uh, when uh, the whole Eastern Europe declined. So you would say, uh, looking at these numbers, that the region is improving, that things are improving in the region. But again, there are notable differences across different sub-regions. And what we can see is that the biggest improvement is actually in the uh, Commonwealth of Independent States and Ukraine in this group of countries. You can see that the middle uh, part here in this figure, uh, it has the biggest improvement. Basically, that owes to the uh, base effects because these countries uh, last year, this period of, of the year, had a big decline in their GDPs because of the invasion, of course. And now they are uh, kind of, not, maybe not recovering, but it's a base effect because they declined a lot last year. They are growing this year. We see also that the Western Balkan countries and uh, Turkey are kind of stagnating. There's no big change in their GDP growth this quarter from the previous quarter. And but we see that, uh, for example, the Visegrad countries are doing slightly worse than what they used to do. And especially the EU member states from Southeast Europe, meaning Croatia, Romania and Bulgaria, we see a slowdown in these countries. We can also see that the Baltic countries are uh, seemingly improving but uh, they again have a bi the biggest decline in the whole region. So yes, they have a small improvement from minus two to around minus one on average GDP growth, but still they, they have a big decline. So uh, the main message from this um, figure would be that there are uh, again notable differences across different sub-regions. Then it's what's very interesting to notice, uh, to look at the structure of this GDP growth overall in the region, what brought this growth basically. And if you look at the different components of, of GDP, we can see that the component which contributed most to the growth was perhaps somewhat surprisingly the decline in imports. So uh, you know that the decline in imports contributes positively to GDP growth. And uh, you see that most of these countries had a decline in imports, some of them pretty sizable decline of 10% or more. And what happened is basically that last year, uh, in the second quarter, the region was importing a lot of energy because of the invasion and the fears that there might be energy shortages and things like that. And now, uh, because of that, imports this uh, this year in the second quarter are declining. Now countries are not rushing into importing energy. And because of that, imports are declining. And that's contributing positively to the GDP growth. This also means that this kind of positive uh, 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 outcome for GDP growth from the second quarter uh, is not likely to be persistent. It's not likely to sustain. It's likely to be mostly short-lived. There are some interesting cases here, like Turkey, for example, where imports grew more than 20% or close to 20%, which is huge. This owes to the strong consumption that Turkey had. We can maybe uh, discuss this later on uh, in, the, in the discussion part. And then also, it's also interesting to see the different components, the other components of, of GDP, how they perform. And we can see that household consumption and exports were basically zero. There, there was no growth in these components. And this is the effect of the crisis. 
household consumption because of the inflation and the reduced uh, purchasing power of households. People are not consuming, people are spending less. And exports because of the recession in Germany and the global slowdown, we see that the exports are stagnating. And that's kind of worrisome. Uh, if you look at the fiscal policy or government consumption, it had it contributed uh, to growth to some extent. It grew by 1.5% overall for the whole region. Still, uh, it, this is a minor increase. 1.5% increase is not very strong support. If you look at investment, it grew similarly by 1.3%, which you would say is kind of positive. Yes, but still, this is a very low growth rate, and uh, uh, there is not, not much optimism there. If you look at the reasons why uh, uh, gross investment were growing in the region, that owes mostly to FDI, to FDI inflows. You can see the uh, average FDI inflows in the region uh, uh, in the second quarter on this figure here. We can see that again, uh, the average uh, for uh, we can see actually uh, some slowdown in FDI compared to uh, what have, what was going on the year before in 22. So the, this time in the second quarter, the average FDI inflows uh, that the region experienced were around 4% of GDP. Last year, it was around 5% of GDP for the whole region. So there is some slowdown in, in FDI inflows, again, owing to the crisis in, to, in, in Europe, in, in the European Union. Again, it's very, uh, there are notable differences across countries. The Western Balkan countries are doing much better than everybody else, Montenegro, Kosovo, Serbia. And also Estonia from the Baltic countries is doing rel relatively well. From the Visegrad countries, we have the usual suspects like Czechia, Romania, they are doing relatively well. But then again, we see on the other hand that some, uh, some of the countries which used to have good FDI inflows in the past, like Hungary, Poland, or Slovakia, were either stagnating or even had, had outflows this part of the year. So th that's again, consequence of the, of the crisis in Germany and in the European Union in general. Belarus is a notable uh, exception here. It had even capital outflows, meaning that comp international companies were leaving the country in the second quarter, which is, of course, not surprising. So that, that's all about the GDP growth. I'm turning to the second point, which is about inflation, which I think is the most interesting, perhaps, part of the story this time. Uh, so inflation, if you look at the overall figures, headline inflation is declining everywhere in the region. And you can see it here, the, the, uh, we compare here the la latest number for headline, headline inflation with the end of last year. And we see that the blue bars here are below the gray bars everywhere, meaning that inflation is slowing down everywhere in the region. Still, we can see that the latest inflation figures are pretty high and they're actually below 5% only in five countries or something. Only in Belarus was the latest inflation figure below 3%. Everywhere else, it was above 5%. So despite the, the, the slowdown in inflation, it remains still very high. And not just that it remains very high, it's all there are also some changes in its structure. And uh, for it's still, uh, still it's mostly driven by food prices. And we can see it here. Food prices, uh, food inflation was everywhere, almost everywhere, higher than headline inflation. Inflation We can see it here. It was a uh, double digit in most of the countries, which is similar to what we are seeing last year. But differently from last year, uh, we, we see that energy inflation is um, not there anymore. So energy is not contributing to the inflation anymore. It's more, it's overtaken by food prices. And that's a big change from the, from the uh, story last year. If you look at the, what's driving food prices, what's causing the uh, food inflation, if you compare the food inflation in Eastern Europe with the global food prices, the FAO index of food prices, we can see that infl food inflation in Eastern Europe is uh, positive everywhere, around two, two digits or above two, di two digits everywhere, whereas global food prices measured by the FAO index are declining by more than 10%, not just in August in the latest uh, month, but also throughout the whole year. So what's what's explaining this? What what's causing this high food inflation in Eastern Europe, despite the deflation in international food prices? It's domestic factors, and it's mostly profits of the companies involved in the food business, supermarkets, producers, everybody involved there. In general, uh, their profits have increased a lot, and that's driving the inflation. Uh, uh, if you if you try to identify some other domestic factors that might contribute to food prices like harvests, they are not uh, driving this inflation because harvests were pretty good in most of the countries. So the harvests are not contributing, it's mostly food uh, uh, profits of food companies. 
Then what's also interesting to know that it's not just food prices who are driving this inflation, but we can uh, uh, we can again speak even more than, than in the past about spillovers to other components of inflation. So uh, if we compare head, uh, headline inflation with core inflation, we can see that core inflation is exceeding, is higher than headline inflation almost everywhere, which means that uh, we, we certainly see spillovers from, the, uh, from food and energy prices uh, from last year to other components of inflation. So yes, food is the main driver of this inflation again, but it's not just food. Other components are have increased a lot. Prices in other sectors have increased a lot, which means that uh, the, um, the structure of this inflation is much more complicated than last year, which means that inflation is likely to, to, to be much more persistent than what was thought last year. Then uh, what's also interesting is that we see a change in the drivers of inflation in the sense that it's not just profits who are driving the inflation. We have written about the contribution of profits in our previous reports, and everybody is acknowledging this. But we are seeing now for the first time in Eastern Europe that wages might have some, uh, some uh, effect on inflation, are starting to have some effect on inflation. We judge this by the uh, by the notion that wage bill, which is basically the real wage growth multiplied or uh, uh, in combination with the growth in employment, it's growing faster than the average than the GDP growth in the region. So uh, real uh, wage bill is growing faster than GDP, which tells us that perhaps wages are starting to have some impact on inflation, which again means that inflation might turn out to be more persistent than initially thought. This especially this will happen especially if we see that uh, firms increase their prices uh, again in turn uh, in, uh, due to the notion that uh, wages have increased and the firms try to keep their markups constant and increase their prices uh, again because of this, this will create a new bout of inflation. So the story of about inflation is that it's getting much more complicated than the, what was thought before. And we are also seeing, uh, so uh, yeah, speaking about real wages, yes, even though real wages uh, seem to have increased in the second quarter of this year, they are still much below than what they were uh, compared to the period uh, a year and a half ago. So this figure shows the latest number of uh, latest value for real wages in the region compared to the last quarter of 21. Basically, how much real wages changed in the last year and a half, and we can see that they declined in two thirds or uh, th three quarters of the countries. In some of the countries, like Czechia, Slovakia, they declined by almost 20%. That's a huge increase, a huge decline in real wages. And that's that's actually an additional reason why some of these countries are not doing that well or uh, why they are having decline in GDP uh, in the second quarter, because real wages are really depressed. Uh, we also see that some countries uh, have increased in real wages compared to the situation a year and a half before, like Bosnia, Montenegro, and some other countries. But still, majority of the countries uh, still have much lower real wages that, than what they used to have a year and a half ago. Which means that real wages still have a lot of um, a lot of pay, a lot of uh, space together in in order to to, uh, to come back to the situation before this cost of living crisis. Uh, and this is not just the only uh, worsening in social indicators that we are seeing that inflation is causing. We also see uh, uh, that there have, there have been official, da official data are out on poverty indicators in the U European Union. And we can see that poverty has increased in many of the countries. And this is one uh, more granular indicator of poverty, which is the share of people that cannot afford to uh, eat, the, to have the meal that they want. And this is the change in that share uh, in the second quarter of this year compared to the, uh, sorry, not second quarter of this year, but in 22 compared to 21. So this is uh, just last year, uh, not, not even this year. And we can see that uh, this share has increased almost in all the countries that we are covering. There are some exceptions like Croatia and Hungary. We also see that in the European Union, it has increased also by one percentage points. But in Eastern Europe, it has increased even more. In some countries like Estonia and Lithuania, it has increased by almost three percentage points, which is a big increase. So the main message here is that inflation uh, is uh, already taking some uh, toll on the social indicators, and we are seeing that in the data. And this has happened despite the uh, big uh, <clears throat> fiscal support packages that some of these governments have introduced last year in order to protect their citizens. 
So despite these fiscal packages, we see increase or worsening in the social indicators. And that means that these indicators are likely to even to worsen even further in this year or next year when these fiscal pack packages will be phased out. So I'm moving to the third uh, story now, third point, which is about the monetary and fiscal policy mix. And like I said before, the main message here is that it's not that supportive. There is again a, 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 some change in the in the uh, monetary policy. So the monetary policy has been restrictive in uh, all uh, in all the countries in Eastern Europe, but uh, it seems that the hiking cycle is e either over or close to to the end, close to being over. So these these are the countries which already started uh, cutting their uh, the central banks, which already started cutting their uh, base interest rates. And uh, uh, here we are showing four countries uh, see, uh, because this is at the end of August. And uh, in September, Poland uh, also cut, the Central Bank of Poland also cut its interest rate. So basically five countries uh, already starting an easing cycle, Kazakhstan, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and Poland now. So some countries have already started a, a, an easing cycle, but some countries, most of the countries have not done it yet, though they have uh, in a way... Uh, stopped raising interest rates. So they haven't started an easing cycle, but they have stopped the hiking cycle and they're expected to start an easing cycle sometime in the future, in the next month or something. And this is the biggest group of countries. We have like five countries here, Albania, Czechia, uh, Poland is not here anymore, Romania, Serbia, and Hungary. And then we have a group of countries which at the end of August still didn't uh, stop the hiking cycle. Uh, here we have uh, North Macedonia, Russia, and Turkey, and the Euro area countries, the ECB, because it increased its interest rate on its la last meeting in September. Although we think that uh, that will be the last increase this year, still it it hasn't stopped. It, it st still hasn't stopped the hiding cycle officially. And uh, it's interesting here to know that, uh, for example, Russia and Turkey have a big increase in their interest rates in the last had a big increase in the last several months. In the case of Turkey, it owes to the uh, ab abandonment of the unorthodox uh, monetary policy that their president were, was pushing for after the elections. We see that they increased their uh, base interest rate by around three times in the last several months. And we see also Russia, which hiked its interest rate because of the depreciation of the rubble. We can talk about this in greater details. So the main story about monetary policy is that we see an end of the hiking cycle, but still that doesn't mean that monetary conditions will ease because the, the, the cuts in the interest rates won't be drastic. They won't be rapid. Uh, they will be minor and interest rates are likely to stay, stay elevated throughout the whole next year. They will be uh, certainly lower than what they are now, but they won't come back to the uh, situation of zero interest rates anytime soon. Uh, and the, the, the tight monetary conditions are, uh, we see some effects of the, of the tight monetary conditions on the lending of the banks, of the commercial banks. Basically, credit growth has slowed down everywhere. There are some exceptions like Russia and Belarus here, but in all other countries, uh, the credit growth in the last month in July is nearly half of what it was at the beginning of the year. So this is the price of the tighter monetary policy. Then again, we have to, to mention, to stress that despite the slowdown in credit activity, we don't see uh, uh, any increase in non-performing loans. So banking systems are still stable, which means that there might be in a way soft lending or there might not be some big costs uh, in terms of, of uh, financial stability from this monetary hiking. There is again another cost of the higher interest rates, and that is that the borrowing costs of the of the governments have increased substantially. So this is the yield of the 10 government, 10 year government bond for the countries that have it, uh, comparison between the latest available data from middle of, of September and the situation a year and a half before. Uh, ago and we see that uh, in almost all the countries, not in almost, but in all the countries, the yield increased on average by around three percentage points or 300 basis points, which means that governments are paying higher price for their uh, 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 loans, that, for, for the loans that they are taking now, which means that uh, fiscal policy will not be able to, to support their economies to that extent uh, in the coming period. So far, there have been some effects, positive effects on fiscal policy stemming from the higher inflation, because inflation is eroding public debt, as we know, and it's also contributing to revenues. But these positive effects of inflation will vanish in the next period. But these negative effects of higher interest rates 
will stay, which means that fiscal policy will be less supportive than what it was. So this is a figure which shows the fiscal support from uh, this year, the first half of this year compared to last year. And yes, we see that it was this year it was even more supportive than last year because of the fiscal packages for protection of the households that many of the governments introduced. But this effect is likely to fade away, to, to vanish in the coming period, which means that the fiscal support will decline uh, in, in the next two years or in, uh, over the medium term horizon. So I'm coming, uh, yeah, sorry, uh, I forgot about this. So this is a figure uh, in, in the EU member states from, from the region. Uh, the uh, fiscal support was also enabled by the, in some of them at least, by the strong uh, inflows of EU money. Uh, but also the, this is not uh, everywhere. This is not across the whole EU member states. We see, that, see again notable differences here. On the other hand, we see Hungary and Poland, which didn't receive virtually any money from the EU funds. Uh, and uh, we also see some other countries like Romania and Croatia, which received three to 4% of GDP of EU money. So there's big difference here. The countries which receive EU money have more positive, uh, better economic results. Uh, and the countries which didn't receive EU money, one of the reasons why they're performing uh, so badly in the second quarter, or not just in the second quarter, but in the last several quarters, like Hungary and Poland, is exactly uh, the, this fact that they are not receiving EU funding. So I'm coming back to the energy situation now. The energy situation at this uh, time of the year, uh, right now this year, seems slightly better than what it was this period of last year. I remember when you were presenting the report last year, the main story was, uh, uh, oh, will there be enough energy to, uh, to uh, pass the winter, to survive the winter? Now we don't have such concerns. Uh, but still, there are some risks. So if you look at the gas storage facilities, they are almost full everywhere. All the countries that have gas storage facilities, they are full almost 100% above 90%. But then again, this is enough to, uh, to satisfy only around 30% of the annual gas consumption uh, in the region. Uh, the big numbers here for Latvia and Austria are kind of misleading because they don't refer only to uh, to the, the consumption that these countries have, but also these are uh, storages for uh, several countries. But on average, for the whole EU, uh, the, the amount of gas which is stored in the facilities right now is enough to uh, satisfy around one third or less than one third of the annual ga gas consumption, which means that if the winter is severe and long, we might see we, there, there might be some issues. We don't expect that. That's not our uh, baseline expectation. We still expect that the situation will be uh, more or less okay, but there are some risks and it's uh, important to note that. Important question is uh, what has happened with the energy transition. So most of the countries uh, cut the use of gas. So the use of gas, gas consumption uh, de decreased, uh, was uh, reduced in most of these countries. And there has been also substitution of gas, not so much Russian gas, but also LNG from other countries, Norway, Norway US, Algeria, and other places. So in that sense, the situation is certainly better. But one thing which is uh, not that better is that there hasn't been much investment in renewable energy. So this is these are the data on uh, renewable energy facilities or capacities in the energy system in 21 and 22. And we see that in 22, the capacity of renewable energy has not increased substantially basically anywhere. There, there are some uh, cases like uh, uh, Lithuania and Poland where it has increased by five or six percent of the total energy uh, uh, capacity, but on average it has been around one or two percent, which is nothing. So basically the green transition is not proceeding. There hasn't been investment in renewable energy, and this is a uh, kind of a bigger big issue for the medium term. It might uh, lead to, to, bits, to some problems in the medium term. So yes, the countries uh, are not afraid that they won't uh, have energy for this winter, but they are not doing enough uh, to, to reduce, uh, to let's say, sort out the medium term or structural problems that they have uh, in the energy systems. Then uh, the last point about the outlook for the next for a year and a half. So like I said before, it seems that the region is uh, converging to a new equilibrium characterized by low growth and high inflation. I won't use the word stagflation because I don't think it's a stagnation, but it's a low growth equilibrium. And uh, before I present our, our latest forecast, just the main assumptions, which are the basis for these forecasts. 
the main assumption about the war in Ukraine is that it will continue uh, for most of the forecasting period. We don't see a near end uh, uh, in the war. Then the, uh, the main assumption about Germany is that the outlook there has deteriorated and also in the euro area. Uh, the growth there is much slower, much weaker than what we uh, thought before. Uh, global growth has also slowed down. China is struggling for many reasons. On the other hand, the US is doing well, but still the US is much less important for our region, for Eastern Europe, than China and EU combined. And because of that, uh, the global outcome for our region has worsened uh, from before. Uh, inflation uh, is has peaked everywhere and is uh, declining, but it's not going to come to 2% anytime soon. It will uh, stay higher than before. Uh, everywhere in the region. And uh, the main assumption about the ECB and uh, its uh, monetary policy is that uh, it has finished its hiking cycle. So we don't expect any new increases in, it, in the interest rate of the ECB by the end of the year. And we expect that it will start uh, cutting rates uh, probably uh, in the first half of, of next year or towards the first half of next year. So these are the main assumptions behind the forecast. And the main forecasts for GDP are shown here. The color code here is that the grayer the area, the worse the outcome in a way, and the more orange the, col the color or area, the better the outcome. And you can also see the arrows um, uh, just by the numbers, next to the numbers. If the arrow is a gray and is pointing downwards, that means that there has been revision downwards in that number. And if the arrow is uh, triangle is orange and is uh, uh, pointing upward, it means that uh, that number has been increased in this forecast. So what we can see for 23, uh, we can see that the gray color is dominating, uh, not everywhere, but uh, first and foremost in the EU member states from this region. You can see this is the first group here. So the, the EU member states are from the region are doing worse than what we expected. And the revisions there for this year, for 23, have been downwards. Uh, owing to the German recession and the weaker outlook for the uh, EU economy. Then we see for the well, Western Balkans and Turkey group, we see that most of the, uh, the, the color which dominates there is orange, meaning that uh, most of the revision, revisions there have been revised upwards because of the stronger uh, growth from the first half of the year, but also because of the strong FDI remittances and also tourism in some of these countries. So these countries are still doing relatively better than the rest. Not far from good, but still better than the others. And speaking about uh, CIS and Ukraine, again, most of the revisions here are positive, are upwards, meaning that uh, the situation there is better than what we were expecting before, which owes in a way to the fact that this, this region, these countries normalized or ad adapted to the, to the new normality. Uh, we can go into details later on, but for Russia, basically, it uh, it's the increased military production. For the CIS group, it's these positive effects of, of the reorientation of the Russian economy towards uh, the CIS instead of other uh, regions. And for Ukraine, it's because uh, of the resilience, impressive resilience that the country has shown uh, with respect to the crisis. So uh, for 24, uh, in 25, the situation is slightly different. We can see that for these two years, most of the revisions or most of the arrows, if you see by, by, by the side of the next to the numbers, are gray, meaning that most of the revisions have been downwards for uh, all the sub-regions. And that means that, um, what, how we explain this? We explain by the worst economic outlook for the whole world, by the global slowdown, also by the worsening outlook for the EU economy and Germany, but also by the more persistent inflation for the reasons that I explained before, and I will come back to, to in a minute. Also to the tighter monetary conditions. Yes, hiking cycle is over, but monetary conditions will stay tight for the, for the next year or two. And by the less supportive fiscal policy for the reasons that I explained before. Governments won't be able to support their economies to the same extent that they were able to do last year or maybe in the first half of this year. So for all these reasons, we expect that the medium term growth in the region will be lower than what we were expecting before. Turning to inflation, the story about inflation in this year is again mixed in the, re in the EU member states. Uh, most of the revisions have been downwards, maybe not most, but half of the revisions in a way. And that owes to the notion that in some of these countries, inflation seems to be uh, coming down to uh, decreasing slowly, I mean, faster uh, than what we were expecting before. 
In the Western Balkan group, on the other hand, most of the revisions are upwards, including Turkey, because inflation there seems to be more persistent than what we were expecting. And in the uh, CIS and Ukraine group, most of the inflation revisions for this year are same as they were before. It's again more interesting what, what happens for the next two years, because this year is almost over. So for the next two years, 24 and 25, most of the revisions are upwards for all the countries, meaning that inflation seems to be more persistent now and, uh, be, uh, and will be higher in the next two years than what we were expecting before. Because the price price pressures are more broad based, the core inflation story that I was uh, uh, talking about before, and because the, the the structure of inflation is much more complex now, it's not only energy prices, it's also food prices, wages, profits, and uh, because of all these things, inflation will be more persistent and higher in the next two years. So now uh, that's all uh, you know, from me uh, in this presentation. Let me just briefly conclude what I said so far. The first conclusion is that the growth in the region in the second quarter of this year was relatively good, but there are many differences across the countries. It was driven only by, mostly by declining imports, which means that it won't last for uh, very long. So these relatively good results will not stay for long. Inflation is moderating everywhere, but it's still high and it's much, much more complex than what it was before. And it's already taking uh, uh, toll on the social indicators. It's increasing poverty and worsening life standards of people. Monetary policy is coming, the hiking cycle seems to be coming to an end, but interest rates won't decline to, re to uh, regions of 0% or uh, maybe 2% anytime soon. They will still stay elevated, close to the current level for the next year. Fiscal policy has been kind of supportive uh, in the first half of this year, but this will uh, change in the next two years because governance will, uh, fiscal space of governance will decline because of higher interest rates. And uh, it seems that the region is uh, trending to a new equilibrium characterized by uh, lower growth and higher inflation. So that's all from me. Thanks for your attention and looking forward to your questions and comments. Okay, Brian, thank you very much for this uh, very detailed presentation. A lot of things to, to think about. Um, a reminder for everybody listening, please type your questions in the Q&A, F&A, or whatever it is in wherever you are in the world, whatever it's called, the, the question and answer box. Um, while you are thinking about that, um, lots of things to, to consider. Um, we have uh, we already have a question in there from Dimitar Nikolovsky. Thank you for your question. He, by the way, also uh, congratulates Branimir on the national holiday of North Macedonia. I didn't know that that was today, so congratulations to you, Branimir. Um, and it, it's a political, the question is a political question, which is not, you know, our core area, but we can try to give it a go. Um, what are our predictions about the possible effects of a chain reaction of political instability uh, following the war, the, the, the war in Ukraine? Um, I mean, Branimir, do you want to say something or... Well, I think we can all say something, so maybe you can start and I can, then I can maybe... Okay, I'll, I'll start to give you a little break. Um, so, I mean, the, Branimir already said in the presentation you know, what the core expectations are for the, the war in Ukraine. So we think, unfortunately, it is going to last for some time. We hope that that wouldn't be the case, but it looks as though you know, neither side um, really has the ability to, to win, uh, well... It, it, as, as far as we can tell, not not being experts, it looks as though neither, neither side has the ability to to win decisively. We have a longer piece from a, uh, a political expert in in the in the report, which members can can download from the website. So, unfortunately, we see quite a prolonged war. Um, we do, though, think you know from our perspective, from an economic perspective probably the main fallout for the countries that are not directly involved is mostly over. So there will not be a big negative economic hit from the war to the rest of the region, even if it continues for a while. Of course, it will continue to affect the economies of, of Russia and uh, Ukraine uh, very much. But for the rest of the region, probably the, the, the impact, which was big last year, ha has happened. I mean, I think so. I, I took part in a debate earlier this week with some some military experts, and it was quite I was quite convinced by the argument that we should be careful, you know, in the, in seeing what has happened since in the Karabakh in in Kosovo, Serbia, in now in Israel. 
we should be careful of just you know automatically linking all of these things and seeing some kind of grand plan uh, behind them. Um, we know, of course, that that these events can can influence each other, but there's nothing maybe determined uh, about all of this. What I think our sense so far in terms of how it affects our topics, you know, the economics is certainly the the, the terrorist attacks in Israel and now the Israeli response are very important in terms of the global oil price, which will rise and stay high and, and will be higher than we had expected it to be. It will affect the global economy quite a bit. Branami already talked about how external conditions are not very supportive, and that will probably become even more the case if the oil price rises and stays high. Our idea that the inflation picture is going to improve quite a lot, um, I think it not fundamentally knocked off course yet, but certainly there are risks to that now. Uh, in in light of 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 uh, global conflict, and it may well, if it continues, have an impact on the U.S. economy, which so far has been quite resilient, as as Branimir discussed, and is kind of the bright spot, really, in a lot of ways, of the global economy. That might change, so it's not good news, uh, definitely. The other thing, and maybe on the politics, just to mention because I think it's it's rather important. I mean, Branimir can say more about Serbia, Kosovo, I think, than, than I can. But one other interesting thing is that the the political developments in Hungary and Poland, which for a long time seemed completely divorced from the economics and didn't seem to matter, now now do. And we do see now, for example, with the withholding of EU funds and the really negative impact that has had on the Polish and Hungarian economies and is continuing to have, we do now see this direct uh, pass through from, from politics to the economics in those two countries, which wasn't the case in the past. But... Branimir, Miriam, maybe you want to say more on this. Miriam, I would give you advantage. <laughs> I, I honestly said this, and of course, like Turkey, so I can only speak for Turkey. And in this sense, that's so the Turkey is kind of in the middle of surrounded with these all, all um, so the so con like the military conflicts. So the like like uh, Richard said, so the, there is definitely a risk. So the, so the upward risk for our um, some of forecasts, especially inflation. However, I think maybe in, in Turkey case, this is not a very huge risk since we are already expecting for Turkey to inflation to stay elevated quite some time. But of course, like increased, uh, so the oil prices, fuel prices so is going to hurt Turkey, maybe even more than some of the other countries we are so the covering right now because so it's still the food prices and the so the its impact on the inflation is very high, which is also mainly driven by the high energy prices in Turkey too. So the but but other than that, so the, I don't have much to contribute on the political aspect. Yeah, not much to add from my side either. I would say that uh, it's a, a negative risk for sure, but still don't think that it's a thing that, uh, that, that will revive that will lead us to revise our forecasts at the moment but it's still a negative risk risk uh, in in a negative direction uh I, I i agree with richard that we have like the the economic side of the of the crisis not just one but all, all these hot spots and that's a higher uh, price of oil, oil price but also maybe other indicators like worsening of uh, declining stock markets and things like that but there are, there might be also uh, some uh, in, in addition to that there, there might be also some smaller crisis or smaller or bigger bigger political crisis in the region so that's the second thing that might happen i still think that i i think that it's uh, possible that there are some crises political crises in the eastern european region in some countries bosnia kosovo maybe moldova but still i don't think it's likely uh, to have that so i would say that that, that chance for uh, that, that, that there won't be a crisis is bigger than that, that the chance that there will be a crisis. So I still think that it's more likely that there won't be anything big, but I, I think that the probability for something to happen has increased uh, certainly compared to the period, let's say one month before, one month ago. Maybe just one point to add on on Serbia as well, well, on, on the Western Balkans in general. Um, I think, you know, Branimir showed that FDI is is really still a very important part of the regional growth model, and it's held up very well, you know, as, as it hasn't in many other parts of Central and Eastern Europe. The Western Balkans is still attracting a lot of FDI as a share of its GDP, including Serbia. 
And there has to be a point at which if the political situation continues to deteriorate in the region and we get these really worrying developments like we had a couple of weeks ago, um, it is certainly a risk considering the importance of, of foreign investors and foreign investor sentiment uh, uh, for, for the growth model. But based on the data so far, what we see, uh, it, it, is, it is not having an impact. Um, moving on uh, now to the next question from Thomas uh, Nabeshuba. Thanks for the question. It's about Hungary, but you know, I think it's an interesting question for probably for other countries as well. This link between the social consequences, which, as he says, in Hungary uh, are positive, or at least you know, that it's not deteriorating in the way that some of the other countries are. Uh, yet, um, real wages are, are very negative. And how do we explain this relationship between uh, the real wage developments and, and the social developments in the region? Yeah, it's a very good question, and I was also thinking about it. My explanation would be that it's probably it probably has to deal something to deal with the price controls that they introduced. That the Hungary was introduced at several occasions, if I'm not wrong, last year, and because of that, perhaps uh, some food prices were lower, and people could afford. Uh, let's say to have the meal that they couldn't afford previously, now more. But it doesn't mean, of course, any no indicator is perfect. Every indicator is. Uh, has some flaws, and I, I I wouldn't say that on the grounds of this indicator, I wouldn't conclude that the social situation in Hungary has improved. It might also boil down to how it was measured, when the survey was taken, uh, was it at the beginning of the year, was it before the elections, was it afterwards, so it, there might be many, many details there, but I wouldn't conclude from these figures that the social situation in Hungary has improved now uh, because of the crisis. I would certainly think that it's the other way around. I would I would take the real wages as a better indicator of what's going on there. I would add to that as well. This is a general point. I, I I don't think it really helps to explain the Hungary example, but just I think it's an important thing because it links back to to what we've been saying or what we found in previous uh, reports. Since the pandemic started, there has often been a huge this, this divergence between real wages and overall consumption in the economy. And I think it's clear that the, the, there are many other things which are important in terms of how people are living, experiencing the current economic situation, whether they're in a good economic uh, position or not, not just real wages. I mean, Branimir showed just one example, the very big importance of remittances. And as they fluctuate, that also has an impact on what people can afford or not. So I think that's been one of the lessons of the last few years. We, and we've had many strange uh, economic stories since the pandemic started. It's overturned a lot of assumptions. And one of them has been that th th there is not necessarily always a very strong link between real wages and, and consumption. Um, the next question from Simon Schutt. Uh, thank you very much for the question. I think very important one, and Branimir, you're really very well placed to answer this. To elaborate on the on the the profits of food companies driving the inflation. What are the reasons behind it? Are they using the higher inflation to increase their profits, and how could this be countered? So, what kind of policy proposals would we suggest? Yeah, so exactly that's the reason. Uh, companies uh, are using the situation to increase their uh, profit margins, and because of that, we have inflation. So this is the greedflation story that many have been talking about in the last year or something. And I think I would say that it seems that uh, at the moment, right now, the story is uh, very well accepted by everyone, even by officials of central banks, like Christine Lagarde had a talk like two months ago or something, in which she was uh, talking about this, the, the, the importance of, of the contribution of the higher profits for the inflation. Uh, so I think it's kind of accepted at the moment. What can be done is a, is a bigger question, is a more difficult question, because there I don't think that authorities or policymakers have a definitive answer or answer that to which they agree. My take would be that uh, we see also in the region uh, that uh, some, uh, some, some measures that can, can work. For example, price controls. So we see that some countries in the region introduce price controls and because of that uh, have lower inflation than other countries. The best example is Albania, which had the lowest inflation maybe in the whole Europe or close to France, but certainly the lowest in Eastern Europe last year. And this year it had inflation of around 7% last year, where everybody was close to two digits. 
And this year it also has uh, one of the lowest inflation of around four or five percent. And one of the reasons for that is that they introduced price controls. Of course, it's not just the only reason. It's not just that. It also uh, they also had uh, appreciation of their currency, which uh, buffered, uh, which served as a buffer to some of of these uh, price increases. But yes, uh, I would say that uh, price controls uh, can be one tool that can be used. We also see some negative uh, experiences. Uh, negative stories uh, uh, in the use of price controls in the region. For example, my home country, North Macedonia, which introduced them on three occasions, but for a very short period of time, uh, only for two or three months. So while they were uh, taken, while they uh, while they were in place, uh, pr inflation was stable. Inflation was not prices were not increasing. But once the government repealed the, the price controls, we saw a huge increase in price. So basically, companies uh, uh, increased their profits or prices more than after the, the repeal, after the price controls were repealed, then what uh, to make to compensate for the lost profits, let's say, during this period. So the, the message there would be that you should keep price controls for some time. You shouldn't uh, repeal them very soon. You should keep them. Uh, for some time and, until uh, the price pressures uh, get stable. But yes, I mean, there can be also other other outcomes like uh, in, improved competition to reduce the market power of companies, uh, increase domestic production of, of food and energy of the prices, of the things which are driving the prices. But these are more longer term or medium term measures. You cannot increase competition all of a sudden or stimulate domestic production, but you should certainly also consider that. But in the short term, I think price controls are something that many governments uh, can consider. Um, Mariam, do, I don't know if you want to add something on this. I mean, as the Turkey expert, you have to think about inflation probably most of all. Um, yeah. I mean, is there, is there something the rest of the region can learn for, like from what not to do? Or is, is Turkey just a unique case, basically? You no, know, really a case on its own. But in, in one sense, it's a unique case because of the, like, the magnitude of the increase. Like Brandon mentioned, so these are the, the prices are mainly based on the inflation expectation. I think what we saw in this, like, for the, this last year has been so unique because it was like a, like, a, like a global hike of the inflation where it also distorted the inflation expectations a lot. Of course, this is also in the case of Turkey, when you see like 60, 70, 80% of the increase. So the, the, the of inflation, of course, firms are adapting their prices maybe too early. So the in in so the Turkey went this whole period actually without any controls. Where in the Western Balkan or the Eastern European countries, when we see the successful and unsuspect unsuccessful. Um, so the measures of price control, actually Turkey went through this whole very high inflation period without any price controls. So in that sense, so the, having any of it is also not a good solution. I think that's like the one lesson, like also Brenna Mir says, price controls can both ways. Timing of it is very important. So the unity, so the monitor the market and like so the implement them early as possible, but also like be patience enough to keep them also in place. So the Turkey actually so they had the so they suffered a lot from the food prices and still is suffering a lot. So the till this month, so the food prices are the biggest contributor to the monthly inflation. So the after the so transportation and the hotels and restaurants. So the and I don't see also so the and Turkey went to other route to so the um, control the inflation instead of price controls, they are trying to dampen the consumption. So the, by tightening the, 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 so the monetary policy, but also like the, with other macro prudential measures. So the, in order to keep the credit in level, I think what Turkey is doing it a little bit like a longer way and the impact of it, we are going to see in the next years rather than immediately, maybe in case of price controls, we could see the impact much faster than these macro prudential measures in the sense that yeah so the and also like waiting so long distorted also consumer behavior so the if you are facing the 60 percent of inflation annually of course you tend to buy everything today rather than tomorrow so the which is also very difficult to change so the we also see not in turkey but also in argentine so the Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is from uh, Clara Vukatic. Thank you for the question. Um, 
she says, can you once again clarify this point? You said for the next two years, there's an upward GDP growth revision despite persistent inflation. Um, Brandon, do you want to start with this? I mean, the upward so, revision is for some countries, certainly not for all. Yeah, no, so what uh, the, what I was uh, trying to say is that is exactly the opposite. Uh, we have a downward revision of GDP in the next two years. Uh, one of the reasons is that inflation is higher. There are several but one of the reasons is that inflation is higher. So it's not that uh, it's upward revision, but it's downward revision. I mean, there are a couple of countries, you know, especially so the, 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 the two, Ukraine and Russia, because of base effects and better than expected resilience. And then a couple in Southeast Europe because of really good tourism seasons or, or EU funding flows and things like that. So we do have a few upward revisions, but not related to inflation, certainly. Yeah, also, actually, Turkey is also is one of the upward GDP revision, but like I mentioned a second ago, so the, 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 the household consumption is so strong, which is, and also like the fiscal spending, which has been driven for the last two quarters, the growth, and that's why like we, we revise it upwards because of the household consumption. Yeah. Okay, next question. Actually, two questions from Robert Anderson. Thank you for the questions. Um, firstly, could you comment on whether the balance of fiscal and monetary policy in Hungary is appropriate and what do you expect to happen to these policies going forward? And what should happen to this calculation if substantial EU funds are not transferred until the second half of next year at the earliest? Maybe we'll deal with that one first. Okay. You, you, you could start, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, uh, uh, of course, the uh, cut of the or the, the the stoppage of the EU funds is uh, affecting the Hungarian economy and uh, also the fiscal policy. I mean, this year we didn't see it too much because they found a way to still have uh, some spend to spend uh, to increase their spending. But I think in the next uh, two years it will certainly start to bite more than this year. So for sure. The EU money, if, if they don't come, uh, they won't be able to spend so much. But uh, our forecast for uh, the fiscal policy in Hungary is that they, they want, they will continue spending, maybe not as much as they used to this year or the previous two, two years, but they will continue spending. They, they won't start austerity. So we still see that uh, they will have some so, uh, kind of supporting monetary policy, uh, sorry, fiscal policy. Monetary policy, yes, I mean, I don't know. My view is that uh, they should, uh, the, the depreciation of the, of the currency is, of course, one of the reasons why they have one of the highest inflation rates in the region, and they must not do that. So uh, the, uh, about the, mon the other asp aspects of monetary policy, I mean, it's very hard to say, but I certainly don't think that the depreciation of the currency uh, is helping in this situation. So like like in Turkey, for example, one of the reasons why Turkey has still 50% inflation is the depreciation of the currency. So uh, I think that they, they should try to, to combat that. Of course, it's questionable how, if what, what tools they have for that, because uh, like we saw, FDI is down, uh, they don't have the EU money, so maybe the capital, uh, the, the inflows of, of capital in the country is not are not so good, so maybe because of that, uh, they cannot do that. But yeah, I mean, it's very hard to, to comment uh, more about Hungary. I mean, I'm not the country expert for it, it's a very specific country, but in general, yeah, this would be my, my comments. I think if I to, to, just to add to that, if I could summarize, you know, roughly what we have in in the country report for Hungary this time, I think the there's a definite sense that, you know, the Hungary, Hungarian economy is really struggling. I think it's the second or third worst performing economy in the region this year, and that's new. I mean, Hungary has been one of the stronger performing economies in general since I think about 2015, and there's always been this sense that. The policy setup is not optimal, whether it's fiscal monetary policy, whether it's the relationship with the EU, that there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a problem there. And it really feels that in this crisis, all of these suboptimal policy choices have really caught up with Hungary at the same time with a really big negative impact on the economy. So monetary policy was, uh, uh, so our, our expert Shandor Richter has been crit critical of it for a while contributed to the very big decline in, in the currency uh, last year, which caused a lot of imported inflation. Also, the um, 
the attempts at price controls went very badly. It seems in Hungary really didn't didn't work at all, or even exacerbated the situation. Then there had to be a big tightening uh, of monetary policy, which then of course is also not good news for the economy. Uh, in order to defend the currency, and then this huge issue with the EU funds. And we see now how important the EU funds have been for the Hungarian economy over a number of years. And as long as they don't return, uh, the economy really is in in a very difficult position. And we are pretty negative uh, for next year as well. We think there'll be some kind of recovery, but nothing very uh, impressive. So I think very much the sense is Hungary is having a particularly bad time you know, everybody's struggling in Central Europe, everybody's struggling, the German slowdown, etc. But in Hungary, it's worse than it needs to be. And that is a reflection of, of the policy choices, both of the past and uh, of the present. There's also a follow up then from from Robert, which then zooms out to the Visegrad countries in general on the fiscal monetary balance. Is there a risk that policy fiscal policy is tightened too fast? The monetary policy also remains restrictive, leading to a prolonged recession. I mean, my sense would be definitely that is a risk. I mean, the fiscal policy room is not there as it was in the past. Branami has already explained that countries came through the pandemic, for example, pretty well to a large extent because they were really able to use fiscal policy, um, both in a domestic sense and also uh, tapping into EU funds. The fiscal policy for all countries is, is restricted and for Hungary and Poland, the EU funds at the moment are are not arriving at anything like um, um, normal volumes. I think on the monetary side, my sense, but Brandon, you, you you can say more. There, it will be very much conditioned by what what the ECB does, and and they will not want to move any of the central banks. Well, of course, Slovakia can't. The other three will not want to move uh, very far away from the ECB because they're worried about the the currency. They won't want to to loosen a lot if the ECB uh, is not. Our sense on the ECB, as Branimir said, it's finished. Tightening cycle will start to loosen next year, but I think everything that's happening at the moment and the recent developments with the oil price do cast some some doubt on those assumptions. Yeah, so I agree on the monetary policy. I agree that it will be restrictive. Uh, probably uh, they won't tighten uh, too much. Maybe not at all, uh, but it will. Uh, they will not cut rates for sure. Of course, it also depends on global developments and on the on the ECB, on the fiscal policy story. I would say that I mean in our forecasts we see a gradual reduction in the deficit, so kind of some, maybe some small fiscal consolidation, but certainly not deficits, uh, not balanced budgets, or even deficits below three percent. Only Czechia of the Visegrad countries of of the of EU member states actually, not just Visegrad, has a deficit of one percent of GDP in twenty five. All the other countries have deficits which are above two percent or maybe even above three percent of GDP which means that they will still have kind of supportive fiscal policies. They won't be so supportive as in the previous years, but they won't move to austerity all of a sudden. So that's our story. Gradual fiscal consolidation. Uh, that will take some toll on the economy. The fiscal support from the previous years will disappear, but still it's not a huge austerity. It won't bring the, uh, the countries to recessions, not, not, not at least the fiscal policy. Okay, next question is from Kristina Velichkovska. Thank you for the question. I think we've mostly answered this, but I'll read it in front of me. You can add anything that you want to add. So on the food inflation, how effective are price controls uh, as a tool uh, in the current situation? Are there alternative approaches worth considering? I think you mostly said what you want to say in that, but if you want to say more, you, you can. Just one sentence because this, uh, I think, specific on North Macedonia. Okay. So I think that I mean the uh, government of North Macedonia didn't do it right, didn't do it well. Uh, the, the main mistake they they were doing is that they were uh, the, the, they, they kept the price controls for very short, and they reintroduced for the third time the price controls like several weeks ago. But they said that they will last only until of uh, till the end of November, and I think that's wrong. If they want the, the controls to work, they have to keep them for longer. We see uh, inflation for September came out for uh, Macedonia, and we see that uh, month on month inflation declined by 0 
1%, not even 1%, 0.1% price level uh, because of the price control. So you see that the effect is very limited. So price controls cannot bring prices down. They can just uh, uh, tame the inflation. They can just make uh, stop, stop inflation from rising or prices from rising, but they will not bring prices down. But in order for them to be effective on a longer period, they, uh, the price controls have to stay for longer, they, not just one month or two months. Okay, next question from Eva Vucicevic uh, is a very good question. I think uh, Branimir and I both care about this quite a lot, so we will try not to make the answer too long. Uh, do we have insight on how EU uh, EPA funds contribute to GDP growth of Western Balkan countries, similar to what was presented for the EU members from, from Central and Eastern Europe? So, Branimir. You, you, you I guess you can also speak a lot about this. No, I think, of course, EPA funds are contributing positively to the Balkan economies, but still because they are not very strong, they're not very high, the contribution is not so big. So that's the main the main story there. We have done some studies uh, on this. Of course, they, they contribute positively. We actually, uh, we have found in our previous studies that uh, the main reason why Central Europe has, uh, has uh, converged more to uh, average to German, let's say, or to EU levels of income, then Western Balkans. Uh, the main reason is that the EU funds, that the greater EU funds that they have received from the Balkan countries. So for sure, EU money is playing a role in the Balkans. It is contributing to growth, but because the money is not so big, it's not contributing so much. So yeah, that would be my short take. I, I think that covers it. I mean, it's something we've worked on a lot. We have quite a few studies actually on the website related to this. Uh, we think it's very important. Um, but I think Branimir has said it all, basically. The, the, the EU does not devote anything like the same kind of resources to the Western Balkans as it does to the to the member states of Central and Eastern Europe. That's now been compounded over basically 20 years. L lots of the region has been in the EU, lots of Central and Eastern Europe. And so, of course, that's a big reason why the economic outcomes are so different and, and why the convergence performance of the Western Balkans has been so disappointing. And that doesn't mean that everything that happens in the Western Balkans is the fault of the EU, but, but it's clear that the... The, the economic support has not been there in the way that it has for for the countries in the EU, and and we we think that should change, and we think the EU could can afford it, and and it's something that they 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 should they should remedy. Um, last question that I see for now, uh, but a, a very important one, uh, from Milica Uvalich, a long-standing friend of our institute. So welcome and thanks for the question, uh, specifically on Serbia. Um, could you tell us, Brian, Miss, something about why inflation remains the highest in Serbia? I'm not sure if it's the highest in the whole region, but certainly in the Western Balkans. One of the highest in the whole region, for yeah. sure. And I mean, Serbia is a very interesting case when it comes to inflation, because last year it was on one of the rare success stories in the whole region because of the price controls. This year, uh, they will have even higher inflation from last year, which I think is the unique case in whole Eastern Europe. I don't recall any other country from the region that will have higher inflation this year than last year. Serbia will, will have that. And it's actually the opposite from last year. The first thing is that they repealed the price controls that they introduced like a year and a half, more than uh, around two years ago at the end of 2021. And uh, they repealed them at the beginning of the year, and that contributed to inflation. But perhaps even more importantly, uh, they increased uh, some uh, uh, prices, some administrative prices, like the price of gas and price of energy at the beginning of the year by around 10%, if I'm not wrong. And they will introduce them, uh, they will increase them again, I think in November now. So that's contributing uh, to the inflation in Serbia. So the reason why Serbia has the inflation, the highest inflation, or among the highest inflation rates in Eastern Europe this year is that uh, the government increased the uh, controlled prices of uh, energy, uh, of gas and electricity, but also it repealed the food prices too soon, I would say. Now it started, it reintroduced price controls once again, you know, the famous Paris story, all of the, I guess everybody from the region knows this story, but I think it's too late and it's too little too late and it won't have any sizable effects, unfortunately. Okay, thank you, Branimir. I don't see any more questions in the chat. We've been going uh, more than an hour now anyway, so I think we can bring it to a close. Um, thank you all for, for coming. Thanks for the, it was a really a very interesting set of questions. So thanks very much uh, for that. I hope we mostly answered them. Um, thank you to Branimir for the presentation, to Miriam for the, for the great contributions as well. 
uh, to Julia and Magdalena who organized all of this, a great organization uh, as always. Um, the report is on the website. For members, you got the presentation, the press release in the chat. There will be plenty more to come from us on this. Next update or full update is in January. And um, we look forward to seeing you then, if not before. So thank you all and goodbye. Thanks also from my side.